make sure we are going through and discussing, right? Where does the spinal cord end? Where does it begin? Uh, what are spinal nerves? And then go look at the brain itself. And again, with cranial nerves, we're gonna discuss how you're gonna be able to recognize those, right? So let's take a look at the brain and the spinal cord on our, bit, on our uh, anatomy and physiology reveal. So on an overview here, <clears throat> we can see, as we kind of cut through, spinous process right here. Then you have the transverse processes of our right vertebrae. And as we open it up, now you can see the dura mater that is surrounding the spinal cord. The dura mater also follows the spinal nerves as they exit out. Keep in mind that when we're discussing this, the spinal cord and the spinal nerves are continuous, meaning like the spinal nerves are part of what makes up the spinal cord. So when you see all these nerves that are exiting right here, all these nerves combine to form tracks that go up and down the spinal cord. Now, I don't know if we can take a look a little bit deeper, but let's see if we open it up, perfect. Now, what you'll notice is that these are the cervical enlargements and the spinal cord itself is larger in certain areas. And look at how narrow it is <clears throat> when we look at the thoracic region right here. In the thoracic region, the spinal cord is very, very small. And then in our right lumbar regions, it enlarges again and it becomes the cauda equina, right? Which is the horse's tail kind of setting. Now, keep in mind, why is it so big in these regions and so small in the thoracic region? Simple, limbs, right? So you have more muscles, you have more room and sensory receptors in your limbs. You make contact with the environment with your fingertips, with your arms and your toes as you walk. Because of that, you have more sensory receptors that come in from the limbs because you have more receptors and more sensations coming in from the limbs. As it comes in, the spinal cord enlarges. You also have more muscles. And not only do we have more muscles, we have better sensitivity of those muscles, right? Because of more sensitivity, we have more motor neurons going to those intricate muscles of our fingers, of our thumb. So then we can pinpoint control of how we write a letter, how we type even. All of that requires lots of motor neurons going to your fingers and to the wrist and to the forearm. Because of that, more motor neurons coming down and out, helping form your, your brachial plexus. That region in the cervical area is much larger. Same thing for your legs, right? More muscles in the legs than in the thorax. More receptors for sensations and proprioception in your legs and your foot and your toes than in the chest and the thorax. Because of that, the thoracic spinal cord is incredibly small right here. All we have in the thoracic spinal cord are just, right, thoracic nerves, nerves that are found on the, right, the ribs itself, and that's about it, right? In terms of sensation, there really isn't even that much sensation and sensory signals coming in. Because of that, spinal cord and the thoracic regions are all very, very small. Now also keep in mind, how can we tell a place is thoracic versus lumbar? The easiest thing to do is to look at the ribs, right? Thoracic vertebrae always have ribs attached to it. You should have 12 ribs, 12 thoracic vertebrae. So anything lower than that with no more ribs, now this is the start of our lumbar region and our lumbar vertebrae. So your main anatomical, anatomical point to focus on is the presence of ribs. If you see lots of ribs, thoracic. If it's above that region, then it's a cervical. If it's below, it's a lumbar region. Now let's see what else we can find here. Eh, not much else, right? You can just see the spinal cord ending. And this is what we call the phylum terminal. The phylum terminal is actually not a nerve. It is part of the pia mater that comes all the way down and the phylum terminal goes to the coccyx 
and it allows us to anchor the coccyx down. Now you can really tell the enlargements in the lumbar region and in the cervical region and how small the thoracic region is. Let's talk about the brain. On a coronal view right here, you can see the brain is cut in half, right? As it's cut in half, this is anterior, this part over here is posterior. This is called the longitudinal fissure. And we're physically gonna separate the two sides. The brain as well is going to be, right, lobes, and those lobes are made out of folded regions called a gyrus. So this is a gyri over here, here's another gyrus, here's another one. The creases in between, like this is a crease, here's another one on that side, right? The creases that are in between the gyri are called sulcus or sulci, right? Now, big cuts that separates different lobes are called fissures. So this is a big cut that separates the hemispheres. This right down the middle is called a longitudinal fissure. And we're gonna see in a second, you're gonna need to know for the next lab practical, the cranial nerves as they exit. And we're gonna see the cranial nerves as they exit goes in order, anterior to posterior, with the anterior nerve getting the lower number. So this is the one that's most anterior. This is our first cranial nerve, our olfactory nerve. And then we'll see later on, right, the other nerves in just a bit. As we take a cut halfway through, or a quarter of the way through, now what can we see? We can see the gray matter and the white matter. The white matter are the unmyelinated axons. Let me phrase that. They're the myelinated axons. And you can see how over here, you have a crossing over of signals. This is the area of the corpus callosum. That's where signals from the right hemisphere crosses over and makes contact with the left hemisphere, allowing communication and integration, right, on both sides of the brain. Deep, immediately deep to the corpus callosum, inferior to it, are these empty spaces. These empty spaces are not really empty, right? They are actually full with cerebrospinal fluid. These are our lateral ventricles right? Make sure you're looking at my videos because I will have a combination of models and pictures for our lab practical, our final one. Again, lateral ventricles on each side where we start production of our cerebrospinal fluid. This region right here is the region of our thalamus, right? And this area over here, is our third ventricle. And deep down here is where we'll see the hypothalamus, right? Now, as we go even deeper, further back, right? On a coronal cut, we can start seeing these cranial nerves really well, right? So they cut the, you know, the trigeminal, so we'll come back to that in a second. So what we'll notice is there's a fissure separating the parietal and the frontal lobes from the other lobe that we call the temporal. So let me show you a lateral view over here. Important thing to note right here, this is the dura mater that's covering the brain. Notice how the dura mater, how tight the dura mater is to the skull. See that? There's almost no room between the skull and the dura mater. This is why when people get bleeds and hemorrhages into these meningeal arteries, all right, what happens is if you rupture those meningeal arteries, you have accumulation of blood in this area. What happens? Well, you're gonna start pushing the dura mater and then you're gonna start pushing the brain down the spinal cord. And we call that a herniation of the brain stem. And it can cause death almost immediately. This is the frontal sinus. This area right here, that's a crista galley. The crista galley, again, reasons why I wanted you to know this, right? Early on, crista galley supports the dura mater over here. And notice the dura mater 
comes down, covers the cerebellum, and continues into the spinal cord and covers the spinal nerves as they exit out. Why is this important? It's important because the same dura mater is found in the brain and continues down the rest of the spinal cord. There are no breaks. There are no areas where there's missing dura mater. It is one continuous unit all the way until the end of the spinal cord. So what we see with the meninges, even though we separate it into meninges of the spinal cord and meninges of the brain, that's not true. The meninges are one continuous unit. Here in the dura mater, it is one unit that covers the brain, then comes down the foramen magnum, covers the spinal cord continuously, covers the spinal nerves as they exit out as well. As we go a little deeper, now we can see the meninges being removed, and now we can see the actual gyrus. So let's talk about the, how can we tell where's what, all right? So first thing I want you to do when you see a brain is look for two gyri that looks like they're running parallel to each other, next to each other, following the same path, right? Once you find those two gyri that are running next to each other, the sulcus in between them, that crease in between them, that crease is called the central sulcus, right? So this is the central sulcus right here. Anything in front is part of the frontal lobe. Anything behind is part of the parietal lobe, right? So here's the central sulcus. This gyrus right here is special. It's before the central sulcus. Because it's before, we call it the pre-central gyrus. This pre-central gyrus is our motor cortex. This is where our upper motor neurons are located. These are the motor neurons that we trigger, which then sends a signal down its axon, and then it synapses with neurons called lower motor neurons found in the spinal cord. And those lower motor neurons in the spinal cord will then take the message to the muscles you want to contract. Perfect. But everything starts up here in the precentral gyrus. How do we know this precentral? Because we always find that central sulcus first. You find two gyri running next to each other, mirroring each other. The one in front is a precentral gyrus. The one in behind the central sulcus is a postcentral. Now the postcentral sulcus or postcentral gyrus is important because that's our somatic sensory cortex. All somatic sensations, for it to be felt, need to activate neurons found here. So all pain, pressure, temperature, tickle, itch, right? From your face, remember your face, there's a large portion of that gyrus just for the face. There's a large portion of this gyrus just for your tongue and for your fingers, right? So this area of the postcentral gyrus is not uniform. It's not like you have the same amount of sensory neurons from your chest as you do from your fingertips. There's more sensitivity in your fingertips for touch, for pressure, for all somatic sensations. Because there's more sensitivity, you have a greater amount of space on the opposite postcentral gyrus to decipher all those numerous sensations from your fingers, opposed to your chest when there really isn't a lot to decipher, right? So postcentral gyrus, somatic sensory cortex. This area right here, close to the ear, that's our temporal lobe. And you have a fissure here. That fissure separates the temporal lobe from the frontal and from the, right, the temporal lobe is split from as well, right, the parietal lobe. Back here is almost like a triangular wedge. That's the area of our occipital lobe. Now, what else do we see, right? We separate the hemispheres by a cut called a longitudinal fissure. Now, we also separate the cerebellum 
from the rest of the brain, the cerebral. This area right here, there's actually a real thick piece of dura mater that separates this area, that separates, physically separates the cerebellum from the rest of the brain. That's called the tentorium cerebelli. So this is a tentorium cerebelli. Tentorium cerebelli is the dura mater separating the cerebellum, physically separating it from the rest of the brain. Now, we do have indirect communication, meaning the axons from the cerebellum neurons, they can go into the pons and then go into your postcentral and precentral gyrus. But there is no direct connection because a tentorium cerebelli is a physical barrier separating the cerebellum from everything else. As we go a little deeper, now we see that physical separation between the left and right hemispheres. Again, you have a longitudinal fissure cutting our brain in half. Because it's such a deep cut, if we did not have this piece of dura mater separating the sides, if this is missing, every time you turn your head, your left and right hemispheres of the brain would hit each other, right? It'd be kind of stupid, right? So we need something that acts as a protection and as a barrier, making sure that the left and the right hemispheres of the brain doesn't collide with each other when you're moving, when you're turning your head. This is that, that physical barrier that separates the two hemispheres. This is called the fault cerebri. Take a look, it's dense, right? Nothing can get through that. So the only way the left and the right hemispheres can communicate is from this region right here, this white matter. We saw it previously as it crossed over. This is a different cut of the corpus callosum. An important thing to notice, notice that it's all under, inferior to the Fox cerebri. Perfect. That means all the signals can get through because it's going underneath the Fox cerebri. This region underneath is called the septum pellucidum. It's this kind of fuzzy, cloudy area. It's actually right, going to be, if we open this up, and I, I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to actually dissect the sheep or cow brain, but usually when we did, I had people cut the brain in half, and then with a pointer, go through the septum pellucidum. The reason why is this, deep, to the septum pellucidum. So you, I want you to imagine you have a pointer, right? Or a scalpel. And with the pointer and scalpel, you're cutting through the septum pellucidum, right? As you were cutting through the septum pellucidum, what happens then? As we cut through the septum pellucidum, we're going past this fiber, all right? Going into the lateral ventricles of our brain. Now, again, the lateral ventricles, so here's that coronal view. I'm gonna come back and forth, right? Longitudinal fissure. You should see the fault cerebri here. They've removed it. Then as we go deeper, this is the corpus callosum. That area right here, that's the septum pellucidum, right? The septum pellucidum separates the right lateral ventricle from the left lateral ventricle. That septum pellucidum, that's what it looks like when we're taking a coronal cut. A coronal cut is when we're cutting it into front and back. So, right, and the lateral cut again. Deeper yet, right here, Fox rebri. And now this is a septum pellucidum. If we go in, then we'll hit the lateral ventricles. This is the area of the third ventricle. Again, ventricles are just open spaces, right? They look shiny and nondescript because they should be shiny, because they should be filled with CSF, right? Again, for the final lecture exam, and by the way, I will extend the final lecture in lab practical until the following Tuesday. The following Tuesday, I believe, is like the, let me take a look at my calendar. 
So then we don't get overwhelmed with material. It's already hard enough, I know, right? I don't wanna overwhelm you too much with material. And let me just tell you now that over here, that Tuesday the 26th, that's when the final exam day will be, right? That's when they'll be due. All right, sorry about that. Come back here. And we will take a look at this again. Can you guys see the picture again now? Let me see. If yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so this is a Fox Rebri Corpus Callosum Septum Pellucidum. This is the Sella Tursica. So we know then this is the sphenoid, the sphenoid sinus. Look how big that sphenoid sinus is, right? This is the pituitary resting on the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. This area, general area right here, that's your hypothalamus. It's kind of crazy, right? Because the hypothalamus doesn't look like anything, but yet we know it contains lots of cell bodies that are incredibly important for homeostasis in our body, right? Again, as we produce cerebrospinal fluid, we produce it very internal, right? It's very deep into the hemispheres of our brain. So it starts out deep inside this, the septum pellucidum. We have two lateral ventricles that produces CSF. As it produces CSF, it goes into the third ventricle by an opening, right, called the interventricular foramen. So all that fluid found in the lateral ventricles will then drain by way of the interventricular foramen, it will drain into the third ventricle. The third ventricle then will produce some of its own cerebrospinal fluid to add to it. And then it's gonna drain down this opening. That opening is called a cerebral aqueduct. Some books call it the aqueduct of Sylvius, right? I just like cerebral aqueduct, all right? The cerebral aqueduct if you take a look at it, it's just an open space, isn't it? That's it, it's just like an open line. That opening allows fluid produced by the two lateral ventricles, produced by the third ventricle, allows all that CSF to then drain through this cerebral aqueduct into the last ventricle. That last ventricle is nothing more than the space between the pons, and the cerebellum. That is the fourth ventricle right here. And it's between the pons and the cerebellum, right? Again, it doesn't look like anything but an open space. The reason why is because that's what it is. It's just an opening, an open space. And here we see apertures, medial and lateral aperture. An aperture is just a fancy way of saying opening, all right? That's all it is. Right? So when you see this and you hear the word aperture, it just means there's openings for that CSF to then drain. As it drains from the fourth ventricle, it then drains out of the brain, surrounding the brain externally with cerebral spinal fluid. All right? Now, again, I believe that was in chapter 13 we talked about CSF. But here, since we're here, I wanted to mention it and review it as well. Now, in the cerebellum, you see white matter that looks like little branches. That's why we call it the, all right, we call it the, right, the folia here. Let me see what else we can see a little deeper, all right? Now, our brain likes to be partitioned slash divided. So we already talked about how this fox cerebri divides the brain into left and right hemispheres, right? The same thing we see in the cerebellum. We are going to divide the cerebellum into the left and right hemispheres of the cerebellum. The one that splits the cerebrum, folk cerebri. The one that separates the cerebellum, the folk cerebelli, right? The folk cerebelli separates the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. The tentorium cerebelli, over here, I believe. Here's a tentorium. The tentorium cerebelli 
separates the cerebellum from the rest of the cerebral, right? When you take a look, you can see the postcentral, precentral, frontal lobe, temporal, right? I don't know why they make that so generic, brain, right? But yes. Again, make sure you review it for the exam. Now, I do have videos on the models about this. And the videos on the models that I have for the CSF production, it's a gray model, right? And that gray model, and the weird thing about my model is, in order to produce the model, they actually have to inject plastic into the openings. So what should be nothing more than an open space is solid in the model. And what should be solid should be open space. So it's kind of inverted, right? So in the model that we see, you have this plastic gray matter that's solid that represents the cerebral aqueduct. In reality, the cerebral aqueduct is just an open space, linking the third ventricle, an open space, to the fourth ventricle, the last open space, right? So the model is an inversion of what we see in real life. What else we see? In an inferior view, now we can see the actual cranial nerves. So let's go through the cranial nerves. And I do have a video going through the cranial nerves. So cranial nerves are named after, right, with the lower number being more anterior, the lower number nerves are more posterior. And then when it starts going up and down, the one that's superior has a lower number than the one that's inferior, right? I know that can sound confusing, but we're gonna talk about it right now. So which one is most anterior? This one, right? It's the one closest to the end of our frontal lobe. And we know our frontal lobe is, it can't get more anterior than that. So this will be the first cranial nerve. The more anterior, the lower. So this is our first one, cranial nerve number one, olfactory nerve. As we go back, then we see the connections here, right? For our optic nerve. Your optic nerve is the second most anterior nerve. Because of that, it's got cranial nerve number two right? One is after two. So that's your optic nerve coming through. The optic nerve comes down and crosses over. As it does that, it forms what we call the optic chiasm. It almost forms an X right here, right? This area is the optic chiasm. And then when we look a little bit more posterior to the optic chiasm, you see this cranial nerve coming out. So nerves are usually kind of lighter in color, right? And they look like little strings coming out. This is our third cranial nerve. That third cranial nerve is called our ocular motor nerve, right? Now, the next cranial nerve is number four. And in the model, we can see it coming from behind, right? Cranial nerve number four <clears throat> is our trochlear. Now, again, there are lots of mnemonics to help you memorize the cranial nerve and the order of the cranial nerves. Some of them are very, 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 very crude, right? So just a little warning. If you're looking for mnemonics for cranial nerves, some of them are really rated X, right? Some of them are a little bit more family friendly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just keep that in mind. Again, first one, most anterior, cranial nerve number one, the lowest number. Then as we go back, we encounter second cranial nerve, cranial nerve number two, optic. As we go even further back, then we see a third cranial nerve, cranial nerve number three, ocular motor. Then on a model, we can see it better. We can see cranial nerve number four. And what I wanna see with the cranial nerves, maybe I can see it better on this one. Oh, that's crazy luck. Right, so you can see the olfactory nerves off the olfactory bulb coming through. And in this model, you can really see a very good cerebral aqueduct, right? Then you can go look at the optic nerve. And the 
optic nerve, I usually like it when it's going into the eyeball, right? So here's an eyeball. The optic nerve is connected to the retinal cells deep in the eyeball, the posterior part of the eyeball. And what happens is it receives light stimuli, sends a nerve impulse through the optic nerve, right? And because it kind of comes out a little bit further back, it gets a second cranial nerve. <clears throat> the third one is an ocular motor. And the ocular motor, right, will be coming out from the front right here. Now the ocular motor nerve's main purpose, the name will tell us what it does, right? It's motor to the ocular muscles. So it's motor signals to every one of your extra ocular muscles, your superior rectus, inferior rectus, your inferior oblique, your medial rectus, your levator palpebrae, superioris, those are all activated by the ocular motor. It's what allows you to move your eyeball left and right, up and down, right? By the way, keep in mind that the ocular motor nerve, the only ones that the extra ocular muscles that doesn't go to is the lateral rectus, which is abducens nerve, and the superior oblique, which is the right trochlear nerve. So ocular motor nerve comes out after the optic. See that? Because it comes out after it, it's further back, it's got the lower number nerve, number three. The next one, trochlear nerve. And with the trochlear nerve, it comes out from the back. It comes out very similar location as the, the ocular motor. But as it comes out, it goes out on the posterior region. Because it comes out and then goes to the front, it's coming out more posteriorly than the ocular motor. Because of that, it's got the lower cranial nerve number. Ocular motor nerve gets number three, trochlear gets number four, even though it comes out at very similar locations. Right? Over here, in front, and then trochlear came from the back and then around, right? Because it came from the back, it's more posterior than the ocular motor. Because it's most, more posterior, it also has the lower number cranial nerves. Do you guys see what I'm trying to say, right? It's a way of hopefully having you understand a way of memorizing it. Number five, trigeminal, right? Trigeminal comes out through the pons. And with a trigeminal nerve, what we're gonna see is the trigeminal nerve is huge, right? It is monstrously big. It comes out at the pons. Previously, we saw olfactory, optic, ocular motor from the front, and then trochlear from the back. So the next one is gonna be now cranial nerve number five, right? And this cranial number five is found solely in the pons and it's huge, trigeminal. Trigeminal nerve has three main nerves coming out of it. And those trigeminal nerves are connected to the facial muscles. So then you have proprioception and all general sensations for your face. Pain, pressure, tickle, temperature, vibration, itch. All of those will be from your face and your forehead will be brought in by branches of the, of the trigeminal nerve. Now, it also goes to your mouth and tongue. The problem with the trigeminal nerve there, not a problem, but it doesn't do any special senses, right? It only carries pain, pressure, temperature, sensations from your tongue and mouth. Now, there are people that have what's called trigeminal neuralgia where it starts off and they drink cold water, right? Because the trigeminal nerve have pain receptors in the mouth and tongue, when they drink real cold water, sometimes it triggers lots of pain going up the trigeminal nerve. Sometimes it's so bad that they actually have to cut the trigeminal nerve going into the mouth and tongue. So then they lose that sensation of pain, pressure, tickle, itch, temperature in the mouth and tongue areas. Obviously, you don't want to do that unless it is really bothersome, right? So now, over here, right, 
Now we're not going front and back, but we're going superior, inferior. So this one's more superior. It's the fifth cranial nerve. We're gonna see the next one. There's gonna be three of them and they come out at the same position when we compare it to their anterior, posterior, superior, and inferior. What do I mean? All right, the next cranial nerve is the abducens. I don't know if I like this picture, All right? And I'm gonna show you the abducens a little bit better on that coronal cut. By the way, all right, when we take a cut right here, this is your substantia nigra. See how dark it stains? That's where we get the nigra word from. This is the area that gets damaged with Parkinson's disease. There's a red nucleus, right, that makes contact with your basal ganglia, basal nuclei, so then it can form a pathway, right, a roadmap on which motor neurons to activate first when you're learning how to walk or when you already learn, learn how to walk and you're starting to walk again. Ah, I don't know, I thought that was better. All right, so here, cranial nerve one, cranial nerve two, cranial nerve three, All right? Here's a trigeminal, even though it looks very small. The next ones are found in a general area. There's one, two, and three cranial nerves that are right, <clears throat> they exit at very similar locations. The big difference is one is more medial, one is more lateral. So when you see three cranial nerves come out at the same general location, superior and, and inferior, right? So these three are at the same general location, right? So what we're gonna see is the one that's most medial gets the lower number. So here's your trigeminal, a little bit higher up, more superior. Because it's more superior, it's got the lower number, cranial nerve number five. Then as we go down, at the junction between the pons and the medulla, at that junction between the pons and the medulla, we see three cranial nerve come out at that junction point. Well, when we see three coming out at the same location, the one that's most medial gets the lower number. The lower number now, <coughs> sorry, is number five, is number six. We just use five for trigeminal. So the next lower number is six. This is our sixth cranial nerve. Then the one that's more lateral, the seventh. And then the most lateral one of the three, eight. So six, seven, eight. Six <coughs> is your abducens. And the only purpose of the abducens is to go into your eye region and go into the lateral rectus muscle. And that's it. The main purpose is to move your eye outwards. This next one then, if this is number six, then the next cranial nerve that's more lateral has to be number seven. This is number seven, here and here. <clears throat> number seven is gonna be your facial nerve. Right? Whereas your trigeminal is your main somatic sensory cranial nerve, your facial nerve is our main motor nerve for muscles of, of facial expression. So all the muscles that we've talked about, zygomaticus major, minor, your levator labi superioris, your risorius, your depressor labi inferioris, right? All those muscles besides your masseter and your temporalis. Right? Besides those two, the facial nerve is going to go to every other muscle besides your temporalis and your masseter. The temporalis and masseter are there for chewing or mastication. That function is due to the trigeminal nerve. But every other muscle for facial expression, smiling, frowning, crying, whining, right? Begging, all those muscles that gives us that appearance in the face are all activated by the facial nerve. And that's this, here and here. Now if you take a look at the facial nerve, we know people can get Bell's palsy, 
facial, facial nerve palsy, where one side of their face becomes paralyzed, right? Well, can we have a stroke? Can we have a lesion that affects only the facial nerve? No. Take a look at all the other cranial nerves it's next to. The facial nerve is right next to the vestibular cochlea, is right next to the glossopharyngeal, is right next to the vagus. So this general area, if you have a stroke, this whole area would be affected. You can't just affect the facial nerve. It'd be too small of a stroke, right? So what we notice with Bell's palsy is that it is a real condition. But when we do an x-ray, when we do an MRI, when we do a CT, when we do an MRA, all right, magnetic resonance angiogram, and we look at the blood vessels, there is no organic true cause, right? We know stress plays a big role of it. If there was an organic cause, all of this region will be affected, right? So facial nerve, seven, is more lateral than six, which is your abducens. So six is abducens, seven, facial. Then the next one, more lateral to the facial, eight, vestibular cochlear nerve. For balance and equilibrium and hearing, right here. Then, right, so it's six, seven, eight. The next one should be nine. So we go straight down. See how this one is gonna be slightly superior than this one or this one. So the one that's more superior gets a lower number. Now, you're probably wondering, how in the world am I gonna see that, right? What we're gonna do is kind of blow it up and you'll see that there's a separation here. Now on the models, I have lab videos on this, on the models, and they show it a lot better. So here, this is our, right? This since this last one is cranial nerve number eight vestibular cochlear. The next one in line is number nine. This is a glossopharyngeal nerve. Here's one on the right side. Here's one on the left. The glossopharyngeal, along with the facial, allows us to have taste in the tongue. So it's connected to the taste buds. Facial gives us taste sensation being carried in by way of the facial from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. T sensation on the posterior third is due to the glossopharyngeal nerve. Glossopharyngeal also activates your parotid glands, allowing us to have increased <coughs> saliva that's enzyme rich. Facial goes to your submandibular and sublingual glands. Because both of these go to the glands, that's digestion function. Both of these are therefore considered parasympathetic cranial nerves. By the way, ocular motor is also considered parasympathetic. Why? It's because it constricts your pupils, right? So this cranial nerve number nine, the next one is right inferior to it, 10. Cranial nerve number 10 is your vagus. And your vagus nerve is the single most important cranial nerve that we have in our body, right? Besides the phrenic nerve, it could be the single most important nerve completely. Why? Because the vagus nerve is the only one that goes all the way throughout your body. Now we're gonna see the accessory nerve comes down, but it only comes down to the neck region. The vagus comes down, and as it comes downwards, the vagus nerve is going to go to the heart, decreasing your heart rate. Then it's gonna to go to your respiratory system, decreasing your respiratory rate. So then you can relax. It's really hard to relax, to rest, when your heart rate is at 130 beats per minute. It's really hard to relax when your respiratory rate is at 30 respirations per minute. Remember, normal respirations, 12 to 14 breaths per minute. If it's at 30, it's twice as high. It's really hard to relax when you're taking so many breaths. So it's up to the vagus nerve to decrease your respiratory rate. 
is up to the vagus nerve to decrease your heart rate. So then we can actually rest and then digest. There's a vagus nerve that goes to the stomach. It goes to the blood vessels that leads to the stomach. It also goes to the GI tract, your small and large intestine. So the vagus nerve is incredibly important throughout the whole function of your body. And it's going to be coming out just slightly inferior to the glossopharyngeal. So here in the glossopharyngeal, here's a good picture of the Fox rebri. Now, take a look right here. How can we tell pre and post central gyrus? You follow the two gyri that runs parallel to each other. See that? The bad news is on our models, only one side shows those parallel arrangement. In reality, both our brains, both sides, should show this parallel arrangement like we see here. All right, this is your lateral ventricles on each side. Let's see what's over here. All right, and you can see the cranial nerves coming out. Now that's not a good view of that though. Right. Again, this is a pretty good view. Let me just zoom in. And as we zoom in here, and you guys can do this at home, all right? I want you to be able to just hit that camera button. As you hit that camera button, you can download that picture, right? Or you can kind of blow it up and download it. So make sure you do that, right? So what I can do is take a screenshot here. As I take a screenshot, if you have Mac, you guys know how to take screenshots? And the MacBook is Shift Command 4, right? Then as you take a screenshot, whoops, what are we gonna see with the screenshot? Over here, my screenshot always goes, and as we open it up, I can increase the size, right? So then you can see right here, right? Facial, then vestibular cochlear, right? For some reason, it looks not that good when I'm showing it to you now, <laughs> of course. Again, make sure you look at every, try everything, all right? When you're looking through these, all right? Again, olfactory most anterior. Then a little bit further back, optic. So one, two. Then a little bit further back, ocular motor. All right, see how it goes in order. Then coming from behind, more posterior. The fourth one, right? Trochlear. And then we come down, the fifth one, trigeminal. And then we go down even more, right? Now you have three in the same area. First one, more medial, gets a lower number. The lower number now is six. We've already used five. So six, this is our abducens. Then the next one, facial, seven. Then the next one, more, most lateral, eight, vestibular cochlear. Now we go down a little bit, right? As we go down a little bit, these two are slightly more superior than this one. So they'll get the lower number. Right, we've used eight, the next lower number, nine, glossopharyngeal, then 10, facial. Right, as we go down, you see it, right, the accessory nerve, that's the only one that doesn't follow my rule. Accessory nerve is 11, right, and it starts in the spinal cord and it goes up. Accessory goes to your trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, allowing us to turn our neck. Then above that, is your last one, 12, hypoglossal, right? So the only one that doesn't follow my rule from having the lower number, most anterior, and then when our brain starts going up and down, right, then the lower number gets the number that's more superior. So the more superior cranial nerve, like this one, right, ocular motors, more superior than the trigeminal. 
what happens? Right, the one that's more superior gets a lower number. So it gets prime number of number three. Then trigeminal gets a five. This one's more inferior, it's gonna get six, then seven, then eight. More inferior, nine, 10. And then the only one that doesn't obey my rule is the spinal accessory nerve that gets number 11, right? Spinal accessory is lower than the hypoglossal. So hypoglossal sh should be number 11, but it's not, right? Just keep that in mind, it's not. Now, let's take a look at what else we see in the brain, right? Now, we have in the brain, in the thoracic region, something called the sympathetic trunk. So here's our right lung. Here's what we call the oblique fissure of your right lung. All right, as we go deeper yet, we will see what looks like over here, spider webs. And it's very, very far back. It's found at the body of our vertebrae. This is our right sympathetic ganglia. I don't like that view. Hopefully I can see a better view of that. Nope, that doesn't look good either. All right now, for the rest of the material for the lab practical, right? And to be honest, in, for like curing and balance and equilibrium, we look at the ear right here. I will use models for the bones, the tympanic membrane, as well as for the cochlea, right? So I will use models, and I usually use models as well for the vestibular cochlear nerve. Just because there is a cochlear component, cochlear means hearing, right? The cochlear nerve will only transmit impulses from sound. The vestibular nerve is for balance and equilibrium. There are actually two different nerves that will then fuse together to form one cranial nerve, vestibular cochlear. All right, any questions so far, guys? I wanted to take some time to make sure you guys see, all right, some of the components that we will use for the lab practical. I have models of the eye, models of the ear, and the inner ear that I was able to grab from downtown. So some of the stuff is gonna be models and pictures of the models. So just like in the last lab practical that I posted, Again, final lab practical, final lecture exam will be all due on May 26th. So I'm giving you a couple extra days to get it done, okay? One other thing, right? I'm gonna give you two attempts on the lecture exam. So, all right, I'm, somebody always asks me, do I take the highest grade? It'd be kind of cruel to take a, lowest grade, right? If I'm giving you two attempts, then what I'll do is give you guys two attempts on the final lecture exam and I'll take the highest score. I won't even average it. That sounds good. All right. Now I will at this point, the reason why I'm not adding more assignments is simple, right? We already have so much to do, right? Most of you guys have to do the lecture exam three and then the final exam and then the lab practical. That's three exams in about a week and a half. All right, so actually in about two weeks. And some of you haven't even taken lecture exam two and lab practical two yet. So yeah, I want you, if you don't start doing those, it's gonna accumulate and you're gonna have like four or five exams in that final week, right? Don't let yourself get to that. I want you by the end of this weekend, to at least have done lab practical two and lecture exam two. You will, after today, have lecture exam three being released, right? If you've already kept up with the other exams, do the lecture exam three this weekend, right? Lecture exam three are on things we've already covered. Chapter, right, part of 13, and then 14, and then we'll talk a little bit about 15, right? Now, with 14 and 15, I already have videos online for those. And I will kind of link to it. I think they're already linked, especially the final exam stuff. 
right? Now, for 15, we'll kind of discuss now for a little bit of time. I know, you know, usually I want this meeting to be only an hour, but because we are actually going to have to, you know, we're so, and it was kind of crazy that they would not even let us, and they didn't let us communicate with you guys during our, like, you know, right, that week right after we canceled our physical classes, right? They wouldn't even let us post anything. Because of that, we lost a week. And then during spring break, they wouldn't let us post anything either. So we lost that week too, right? So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about chapter, right? Actually, the lecture exam three is on chapter 11 to 13, to the cerebellum in 13. Lecture exam for the final exam is from 13 to 14 and 15. 16 will be on a quiz, right? Chapter 16 and chapter 18 will be our third quiz that I'll release next weekend. That third quiz will be optional if you've already done well on the other two quizzes. Remember, I only take the highest two quiz scores, right? So let's say you've gotten a 95% on each of the first two quizzes. What happens? Uh, you don't even have to take the third one, right? Even if you do, you get an extra five percentage. If you get 100%, that's the only thing that makes it worthwhile. It might move you up a little bit but not a lot. So if you've done like 90, 95s on the other exam, on the other quizzes, right? You might wanna take it just for fun to see if you can get 100, but you don't have to. Now, if you've gotten like an 80% or lower on the other two quizzes, I would take this optional final one, okay? Now, I forgot that <clears throat> we will have time next week to discuss chapter 15. So what I'm going to do is ask you guys, right? Should we go into chapter 15 now for 20 minutes or should we wait until next week? Right? So you can chat it, right? Or just right, send me a message if nobody wants to say anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. Okay. I think we can do it. Yeah, we can do it. Okay? Yeah, I would do the 20 minutes. All right. Let's so let's go, let's go through a little bit of 15, right? For some reason, can you see my share? Uh, let me see. Let me get this through. We'll start a little bit about chapter 15. Right, with chapter 15 material, chapter 15 is all about special senses, right? And we're talking about special senses, and for some reason, I got to re-download it. By the way, right, we have a lot of leeway with uh, incomplete guys. So if you're not doing as well as you'd like, right, I can give you an incomplete. And I know nobody signed up for taking a purely online course, right? So we understand that. So if I give you an incomplete, usually, right, you can take that class over without having to pay. So if you're not doing well and you'd rather take an incomplete, right, because you're not doing well, please tell me. I don't want to have to fail anybody, especially with what's going on now. But you have to tell me, right? We can give incomplete so then you can make up everything later and even retake the course to learn more, right? in the next semester. Now I'm expecting us to have some kind of class next in the fall semester, some kind of physical class. You guys have heard that certain schools, they've canceled classes already, right? So some schools have canceled class already. Some big colleges has canceled class already. And when that happens, right, usually the little colleges follow along. So when we're looking for things like, you know, we're looking at trends in the fall. I expect us to have lots of different combinations of online and in-person, right? 
Most of it, I think, will be online though, right? I just, you know, for us, I don't think there's a way of making it at this point safe enough that we can do it at a point where nobody gets, you know, sick, right? I'm having a hard time uploading my PowerPoint. So let me see if I can do that. Let me up one time. Let me open it up and then we'll get started in just one second. Now, normally this chapter 15 is pretty difficult, all right? Now I say that not to scare you guys. I'm just saying that because it is one of those things where it is usually pretty alien to us, right? This chapter 15 material. So I'm gonna stop.